Coach, obviously, before the series, we talked a lot about Lusty not being there last year, not being here this right. year. Just what did it mean to see him get that empty netter at the end? And what kind of impact did he have in game one? Well, we we've always thought highly of him last year, but I think uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. When he missed that series, we really noticed it. It, it, it changed so much of what we do. Um, he's been a really good player for us this year. He's one of those guys on a team that that doesn't get mentioned first, but if you come into the room, he's one of those guys you need, right? He's one of those all-around players that grinds hard, that makes good plays, that blocks shots, that's probably focused on the defensive side of the game, so it doesn't get quite as much notoriety, but really important part of our team. Front right. Paul, I know you were very upset last night about how unbearable your household is now, <laughs> but what, what has it meant to you to watch Jake's evolution, his growth, his success, and to have these side-by-side, -side, co-current playoff runs in the house? Uh, you're just a dad, right? Like, so I think my overall favorite part is he's fallen in love with a game that I did, but found a different way to fall in love with it. And is probably more passionate about it than I am. So that's a fun thing to watch your kid go through. To You always want them to kind of like find a purpose, find their thing, find their reason. And, and he hit it at 16, right? He, he got this kind of unusual break to call a game, and he was just wired for it ever since. So, yeah, I, I'm thrilled for him. It's really important to, um, to be associated with such a good organization, so very well run. Craig Brush, who's the president of that, I knew 40 years ago in Detroit. He came through the CompuWare group with me, so I met him years and years and years ago. And Mr. Kermanis, the owner of my junior team, was the original owner of that team. So there's almost family connections to it. Um, I still haven't talked to him because now he probably has people. I gotta, I gotta get a hold of him. I gotta go through, go through his people to get a call. But I'll catch up with him later today. I hope. Right side, third row. Paul, when you, you watch back last night's game or, or look at it with the emotion removed, is, is there anything in particular you'd like to see the team uh, improve on? I think it happened during the game. We liked our third period an awful lot of the game, and that would be the way we would like to look. Uh, there wasn't necessarily anything new. There's, some of this is contextual, and it's probably good for us to see. We score early in that game, and you find sometimes in those pressure games, the team that scores early, the other team gets to their game right away. It kind of, if it goes to even for a long period of time, there's just constantly feeling each other out, right? And that wasn't. So the, we get the one. They get some good chances in the first. They're feeling good, and why wouldn't they? We get a big save on the PK and then score again. So now you're sitting there, whatever, 38 minutes of hockey left to go. We're up two. We're going to see them at their most dynamic and explosive, and they were four and five up the ice, uh, tremendous amount of speed off the rush. So it's, it's good to see that. And then we, we liked our third, and, and for us, we hope that would be a starting point. Left side, third row. Um, you've got a, a real good shutdown center in Barkov, obviously, real good shutdown D-man among a few in, in Forsling. What's the benefit of having kind of one of each? And in your experience against a, you know, somebody like McDavid, the difference between assigning a center to that versus a D or a D pairing? Well, I think the stronger match is almost always on the back end for all teams, that, uh, that those guys would play more consistently against the other team's best. It's... I don't know which is more difficult when the two big fellas are split up or together. It's just an awful lot to handle. I don't view Barkov as a shutdown center because he doesn't hit the ice with the idea of this is all I will do. He's wired first to think defensively team hockey first, but he's a pretty gifted, dynamic man as well. And he carries that weight of having to do both. And there's there's a challenge to it, but as you will see with kind of, there's always a give and take in that. We need Barkov also to push the offensive envelope to make the play he made on the first goal. So he's, it's not a sit back gap game where all he does is grind it out. He's far more gifted than that. Right side, first row. Hey, Paul, uh, you kind of hinted at it there, but how does dry settle in particular make your life difficult? Like he's carrying his own line, then he's matched up or he's spotted with uh, Connor you know, coming off a power play or when they're playing from behind, he's on the power play. 
well, you could just keep going, man. You got it. You don't, <laughs> you don't need me to answer that question for you. And I mean this respectfully to all of you, because it, it's me too. You have become desensitized to how good those two players are. And I understand why. You, you see it every night, and they are so dynamic and so special. But after a while, you get used to it to the point that you'll start saying, why doesn't it happen every shift? <laughs> well, it almost does. Um, th th they are truly true sp special players because of all aspects of the game. You can do all things right and still not stop them. So you have to have layers. You have to have gap. But I don't know how the heck you gap that speed. They're just dynamic. Left side, second row. Uh, Paul, can I ask you um, a little more on Jake? Uh, you know, how much has he helped you sort of evolve with the media? I know that he's not technically uh, media, but it feels like being well, around you the last two postseasons, you've really helped us do what we need to do with yeah. uh, some of your answers. Uh, no, I've got an idea. It's, it's, it's just the first thing that pops into my head isn't the last two years. It's... So my kids weren't allowed to get autographs uh, growing up. J just, I, I wanted my kids to see the players as people, respectfully as people, and, and so they weren't, except we're in Toronto, and uh, Matt Sundin and Daryl Sittler were the two autographs that Jake wanted and he was allowed to get. And I, I'm in a room and I'm watching, I said, okay, you can, you can get those autographs, and he's walking over, and then I go through that kind of, I guess, horror that all fathers might go through. And I, I would have no reason to because they, they were both incredibly generous men. But as my kid's walking over, you're going, I hope they sign this autograph. Like, <laughs> what, is the, what if they say, get out of there? Get away. Then I'm going to go into kill mode here. Like, you, and I, and I, so then I realized all of you are the same in some ways, right? Like, you're somebody's kid. I know it doesn't translate the well, but you start to see then your your kid in the media, so you, you, you know, the Walter Midiot, and he's going to ask some coach a question after he's got to get an interview, he's got to get a quote, because he does communications kind of as well. Well, like, I would be some kind of sour if a grumpy old coach, because he lost 3-2, and I've done it, and been in a bad mood, and been pissy, and I've done that, but you do that to my kid, and I've got a hate on for you pretty quick. So I'm mindful of that when I come in here now. <laughs> I'd like to think I was reasonably generous with my time and try to be thoughtful when I answer my questions. My first stint with the media was in 2004, I think. It might have been my second. Anyway, I, I won't say the, the network because it pisses people off. The other networks get pissed off. Anyway, I'm over in, in, um, in Austria. And I went over just to, to see a tournament. I'd never seen a world championships, couldn't get invited to it. so. Uh, I went over to watch, and I'm doing it with Darren Dreger. And, and I don't know what this means. All I know, it's about 11.30. It's raining sideways, and we're standing outside because we got to feed something to a truck. And I'm thinking, this job sucks. <laughs> <sighs> but I, like, I remember that going, this is way harder right, than, than I thought. And, and that, that had an impact on me, too. So I try to be respectful of your time. And then, you lose enough hockey games, you lose the arrogance that you're special or that your job's special, so we all got a job to do here today. And, and I know you sometimes, especially when you get seven-day block, you're grinding. Kevin the ex asked me to keep my answers short. Sorry, brother. Um, but, but I get it. I get it way better now than I did before. This doesn't have to be an adversarial relationship. As a matter of fact, not one of you missed a check last night, so you're all good with me. And, and somebody's going to take a shot here at me, and that's part of your job, too. And I've learned not to carry the burden of other people's opinion. Take the SM, right? <laughs> Mr. Rashog weighs in. I actually, I actually work for both over time. Actually, no, that was Sportsnet. Hey. Hey. <laughs> that, that, uh, Mark Morrison was the guy that got me in. Yeah, and then I went over and spent some time with Steve Dryden at DSN. Yeah. Take a few more questions for Coach. Right side, fourth row. Paul? Did a little hockey night in Canada, too. I'm just looking over there, sorry. <laughs> <sighs> so you've been doing this for a while. Mm. Uh, I'm asking you about guys who are playing hurt. 
-hmm. and they want to play. And I know the respect that guys get when they're, you know, in the old days they would take right. a needle. I don't know what they're doing now to get into games. At some point, when a coach sees a player who just can't get there, who's not as effective, yeah. tell me about your role in making the decision that maybe it's time for that guy to sit down. Matthew Kachuk, last year. He had earned the right to play that game, but he wasn't playing the next one. And to his credit, he had three great chances to score and we're down a goal and he's net front. And if he's healthy, based on the playoffs he's having, he scores that goal and he, and he couldn't, right? And it was all he could do, but he was so, I'm watching a guy with a broken bone but it's pain tolerance at that point, right? The doctor sign off if he can handle it. He's earned the right to play that game because he says he needs it and, and he's earned it. So I give him that game. And then the question is, is there, you know, you got to talk to him the next day. I wasn't talking to him the next day, right? And, and to his credit, when I went to him, I said, Matthew, it's, it's not there. He goes, I know, I know, but I, I needed to know. So that one actually is fairly easy and cut and dried. It's the other ones. I don't know that I've always, Culture's changed, right? I don't want to tell you all the stories. Like, I had a guy play with cracked ribs once. And, and, and I think back, why'd you let that happen, right? Like, you, you're the guy. But this is how much better the game is now. I'm not the guy making that decision anymore. Really, truly. Like, anything above the shoulders, anything, it's got nothing to do with me. Anything that's even remotely concussion related, and I don't mess around with that. And I don't think any coach does, truly. We've seen players, you know, deal with it. It was different. 30 years ago, it just was. So the science is involved. You get to know your players, what their pain tolerance is, what they can deal with. And at the end of the day, is he better than the 13th guy? And then there is, there is a moral line there as well. I can play, I can play. I know you can, but you're not, and you have to do that. Two more for coach, front left. Uh, Paul, what was it like, what was the feeling driving to work this morning, knowing you didn't play your best game, you got to it in the second, and yeah. you're still up one nothing. So that's a, so I had that went through that, and um, it, it's the same as almost everyone, right? What can you learn from the game is the most important thing. You know, where can you get better? But you want to temper all of that when you sit down and watch your video because the other team gets paid too. You got some pretty good players over there. So if you just play your best game, what does that look like? They don't touch the puck. Right, like, like our most, we fight the extremes of this mentally as well. You lose a game, it's not the end of the world. You did some good things, you win a game, you're not that good, right? Don't get that carried away with it. That one's kind of stuck in the middle. I thought the first period was an anomaly. I thought the second period I didn't like because we, we can be better in that push. And then I liked our third. So that was kind of my starting point when I, and that would have been the theme and the idea. Is there something systemic or thematic that we need to deal with? The one-offs don't matter. Um, but if there's a theme, we've got to deal with it. And then what, did we, what would you like to replicate? What can we do more of? Last question, right side, third row. Yeah, Paul, I know you touched on it, but just to expand, uh, my colleague Ryan Rashad calls it the nuclear option when, when they decide to put the two guys together yeah. on the same line. And, um, do you guys communicate in that moment? You know, after the PK, they're going to do it, and there's other yeah. moments. But do you communicate, or is it all understood in the pre-scout how you guys are going to try to handle the next couple of shifts, not just against them, but then the shift after yeah, we, that? Yeah, we would know. We, we look a certain way coming off the bench, off power plays and penalty kill. That's easily found by the other team. Um, there was a slight adjustment by us in terms of minutes, and to handle that specifically. And then it's, it's, there's always a give and take for both teams. Put them two together, it's not bad. Um, but then there's not one of them on the other line. That's just great, right? we can do the same thing. And so at the end of the game, we've got Lusteran and left wing with uh, Barkoff and Reinhardt. Well, they're pretty good at that. But they're also gonna be short of man. So, but I don't run that all year. You put it together in, in the context that it comes. They do. We have a plan for it. Everybody has a plan for it. Hasn't worked, right? The numbers say it absolutely has not worked. So you just hope you get enough minutes while it is. 